Foundation. The Foundation, if you don't know, is a nonprofit organization that provides education and communication to the public and policymakers in regard to the Senate and Congressional Western Caucus priorities for Western and rural America. The Foundation is pleased to host this briefing uh, with our honorary co chairs, Chairman Steve Daines of the Senate Western Caucus and Chairman Dan Newhouse of the Congressional Western Caucus. Along with our guests, Western Caucus members, and soon to be here, Caucus Chair Elise Stefanik. I uh, want you all to know that we're streaming this live on the internet via our social media channels, so this is going out live for everyone here. And uh, for now, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Daines from the Big Sky State of Montana. Great, thanks, Gerald. Thanks for coming over to my house colleagues here to the, uh, the other side of the hill. We appreciate that. Um, listen, we've never seen such a radical administration as this administration. Uh, we see that face-to-face -face with the nominees that come forward. It's one of the important uh, roles of the U.S. Senate. That we are in the personnel business. Where the president nominates, and then they ask for our consent. Uh, never seen anything like it. Truly, the ideology that we see from these individuals who are being placed in leadership, important positions in the uh, cabinet and below, uh, are frankly they're dangerous, particularly to our Western way of life and things we hold so dear to fighting for the Western Caucus. We saw just hours after this president was inaugurated when he kills the Keystone Pipeline for us in Montana, those are fighting words. Uh, that pipeline first enters the state of Montana, it was uh, 60 to 80 million dollars a year of tax revenues every year for six impoverished counties in the eastern part of our state. As we say in Montana, those are counties that have been road hard and put away wet. They struggle to make ends meet, just to fund law enforcement, to fund teachers. I mean, the tax revenues that, that would have been coming in there would have been a huge windfall. Not to mention, if you take a look at what's happened with Russia, Russian oil imports, they have doubled since President Biden took office. In fact, if you do the, uh, the mass balance there in terms of what the Keystone Pipeline would have delivered versus what Russia is now sending us, uh, they're about equal in terms of barrels per day, about 900,000 barrels a day. We now get from Russia, instead of oil we would have got from Canada, and 100,000 barrels a day of Montana North Dakota oil coming on the Keystone Pipeline. So we're doing all we can to fight back. The oil and gas leasing ban, pushing back on that. The Green New Deal, every element of it, and then of course the Build Back Road Plan, they try to get through the Senate, and I applaud my House colleagues for standing firm against that, and, and also for my Senate colleagues that stood firmly against that as well. Uh, we have been very united in our opposition uh, to stop uh, what could have been a $5 trillion spending bill with $3 trillion of additional debt, and then blocking these radical, radical nominees that uh, is the important part of what we can do in the U.S. Senate to protect our Western way of life. We need to pass the Cottonwood Fix. For those of you who are uh, who believe that force management is important, I think it's about all of us, we've got to get that fixed. The Supreme Court said we've got to resolve this Eighth Circuit, Ninth Circuit discrepancy. I'm an engineer by degree, not a lawyer, so I'm out of, out of my league at the moment, but let's tell you, there's a discrepancy in those two circuit courts. The Supreme Court says, you fix it, Congress, we're not going to fix it. And so we've got to get that done if we're going to stop the serial litigators, these radical environmental groups that litigate so many of our collaborative force projects around the West. Um, supporting our locally driven conservation efforts in opposing that 30 by 30 initiative that came from the administration. Uh, we've got as proud a moment for the Western Caucus, the Western Conservation Principles, is prioritizes working lands and local driven solutions, bottoms up, instead of these DC invented and top down kind of driven solutions. I should call them problems, not solutions. Uh, as it relates to agriculture and farm jobs, uh, addressing the issues going on meat packing. There's an important role of federalism here to allow the states to have a play a bigger role here in state inspections. Uh, our founding fathers, there's a lot of wisdom they had in federalism of trying to decentralize and always fear the power here in this city. And that's why we have important the Tenth Amendment, as well as our founding fathers said elections and other things should be administered by the states, not by the federal government, because they feared a king, they feared tyranny, they feared concentration of power. And of course, we all know we're seeing that face to face here in Washington under this current administration, this power grab. Um, lastly, very important issue for us in Montana, for many of you out west, and that is the Endangered Species Act, what's going on with sage grouse, grizzly bears. Uh, I, I literally had 22 of my Senate colleagues signed a letter asking that the wolves be relisted. 
sent that wow. to uh, Secretary Allen. Wow. Well, so um, I know Colorado has, done, has now just voted to reintroduce wolves. Uh, we, we fight that battle back home in Montana, but uh, uh, we need to keep the wolves uh, managed by the state, and then we need to take the next step and delist the grizzly bear. This is a huge issue for us back in Montana uh, and out west, and that's a battle we're fighting hard. Um, it just makes common sense number to way over the targets, way over the targets. This has now become a human safety issue. I spend a lot of time outside. I don't have a suit and tie on. I've got a rifle from my shoulder. I spend a lot of time in where the, uh, where the show Yellowstone is supposed to take place in Paradise Valley. That's where I spend time chasing mountain lions, wolves, elk, mule deer, and so forth. And it, believe me, when you're doing that, there's a concentration of grizzly bears there. Some of the highest in the lower 48. And when you're out there, you have to, have, you have to be ready at any time. Uh, frankly, to, for self-preservation as well as for predation of livestock. It's the number one issue predation right now is grizzly bears. It used to be wolves, it's now grizzly bears. So it's time to delist the grizzly bear, celebrate the recovery of the species, and return the management species back to the states. So plenty going on here. Thank you for all that uh, you all are doing on behalf of uh, the Western Caucus and the fight that we have here. Daryl, for your leadership always. Dan, Great to have a partner like you over in the house, and um, keep up the good fight. Well, thank you very much, Senator Daines. It's good to be here with you over here on the Senate side of the rotunda. Good to see so many folks in the room and joining with us online as well. Um, Certainly, I want to recognize when she gets here, our, our newest member of the Western Caucus. Yes, we, we don't discriminate. We'll take people from all over the country. But uh, Elise Stefanik, our uh, conference chairwoman, will be with us shortly. And so I want to give her an opportunity to say a few things as well. But let me talk a little bit about uh, what we've done and what I see we're going to be doing this coming year. And I think it's going to be a really exciting year. And I'm happy to see so many people interested in what the Western Caucus activities are. So, if you've been following along, and I know a lot of you have been, you know that the primary goal of the Congressional Western Caucus has been to lift the voices of rural communities. Not just in the West, but all, over, all across this country. Because, face it, the, the policies that are being put forward that if, impact us most in the West can impact the entire country. And my priority as chairman is to ensure that our members are guiding our actions and our messaging. And humbly, I think we've been successful at that. We have some great members of this caucus. We really do. I, I think this is the best caucus on Capitol Hill. Unfortunately, or fortunately, no matter how, depending on how you look at it, the Biden administration has given us so much to work with, too many opportunities to engage on all of these issues that impact our rural communities. And I'm a farmer, I can tell you, issues impacting agriculture, like the waters of the United States, at least, welcome. Come on over, we've got a chair for you. The waters of the United States issue that impacts agriculture as almost every part of our economy, to the administration's work to uh, attack American energy production. It runs the gamut of many, many issues. We've worked to utilize every single opportunity we can to highlight the policies that are passed in Congress, in Congress and that the decisions that are made by the federal government impact real people, just like Steve was talking about the communities in Montana in those six counties. They impact real people, families, businesses that all of us represent throughout rural America. Now, I mentioned the Biden administration has given us a lot to work with, and they have this year. On top of that, we want to start focusing on some of the successes that we've been able to see at state and local levels. You probably heard this news, but I can, I can say very happily from, from a new cobalt mine in the great state of Idaho to a forest collaborative in my own home state of Washington to emerging nuclear technologies 
and advances that are being made by the oil and gas industry. We have a lot to celebrate. There are positive developments happening in our members' districts across the country. And this caucus is going to be making a concerted effort this year to highlight those successful projects. One of our core beliefs as a caucus and as representatives from the West is that local communities, and this is a tenet that we adhere to strongly, local communities, those that are the closest to the land, they're the ones that are the best stewards of our environment. They're the best stewards we could possibly have. We work hard in Congress to ensure that this is reflected in every piece of legislation that we introduce, every letter that we send, in all the programming that we conduct as a caucus. Last year we introduced the Western Conservation Principles. And that remains also a major tenet of the work to stand up against this federal one-size-fits-all policies when it comes to conservation and management of our lands and waters. And we will continue to develop policy proposals to Im improve the Endangered Species Act, to push for permitting and regulatory reform that will make it easier to deploy energy and forest management projects, and working to empower rural communities to pursue economic development while effectively creating a healthy and resilient environment for future generations. A lot of 25 cent words in there, but it means we are looking for opportunity for rural America. One of my goals for 2021 in my first year as chairman was to expand the caucus's influence both on and off Capitol Hill. And I think it's extremely important that we engage with the industry partners and stakeholders. I'm happy to say that many of you are in the room today. We've also worked to engage with House committees, with other caucuses, and other coalitions. And there are many that we've, we've been able to work with. I've got to give a shout out, though, to our House Natural Resources ranking member, Westerman. Him and the members of the committee, the Republican members, have been outstanding and they have embraced our relationship to help build this strong, strong relationship that we have. We want to do more of those things. We want to solicit feedback from both industry and other members in, on Capitol Hill. But we want to prove to our constituents and to everyone in rural America who feel left behind by this administration, by the Biden administration, and I gotta say, by Democrats in general, that when Republicans take back the majority, we have a plan, we have a solid platform, and that we are ready to hit the ground running. Now, as I mentioned, we've got some esteemed members here of their executive committee who will be able to elaborate on some of our priorities. I'm happy to have them here, but first, I'd like to welcome our esteemed chairwoman of our Republican conference from the great state of New York, to Ms. Stefanik, to say a few words for us about about how the Western Caucus can work with the Republican Conference to promote the values, the practices, and the policies that we all think are so important for rural America. So Elise, can I turn it over to you for a minute? Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Chairman Newhouse, and thank you to Chairman Daines and the entire Western Caucus, my colleagues, for your continued leadership and support on issues not just facing the West, but facing our entire country. The Western Caucus includes members from across the country. Each of us have very different and unique districts, but we all share very similar goals. Support our nation's farmers and ranchers. Promote energy independence and the tens of thousands of jobs that go with that. Protect our country's natural resources while actively managing and increasing access to our public lands. Expand rural broadband fighting against Joe Biden's proposed federal takeover of our waterways. The members here know that our farmers, our ranchers, our energy job creators are the backbone of our economy and some of the best stewards of our environment, always working to leave this planet better than they found it. And as Dan pointed out, I'm from New York. So why New York? You may not know this, but New York's North Country is home to a very robust agriculture industry that I'm proud to represent, representing tens of thousands of dairy farmers, apple growers, maple producers, and that's the backbone of our local economy. 
Rural issues such as rural broadband is critical to making sure that our small, business, small businesses and families are able to grow. We also experience, much like my colleagues, the overreach of the federal government and the state government, unfortunately, in New York on a daily basis. So we have a lot in common with the issues uh, in this caucus, which is why I'm a proud member of the Western Caucus. I am so grateful for the work that the Western Caucus has always done to support the Republican Conference and that they will continue to do as we work to earn back the majority this November, standing up for the American people, standing up for the American economy, standing up for American national security. So I couldn't be more proud to be here today, and thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you very much, Elise. Great to have you on board. So as I promised, we've got some members of, our, of my executive uh, committee uh, with us today to talk a little bit more about the priorities that they see uh, as important to them and also to the conference. We guess we can kind of go by seniority. So that means I'm going to call on the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Amade, first. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad we're not going in the order of maturity. So, <laughs> with, with that caveat, uh, I will attempt to be uh, crisp. Um, first of all, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. I was going to give uh, Senator Daines a bad time about we had to have this over here so that he didn't have to walk so far because once you get to the Senate, you need some ambulatory help and stuff like that. But, but then I looked around and I'm like, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of border interests here, which is kind of unusual for the West. You know, you've got northern border, you've got southern border. But to my fellow Heartland folks, good to see you guys. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about what we know. Most of you folks have been here quite a while, and and I, I want to just say a couple of things. One is, oversight is a wonderful thing. Oversight is a wonderful thing. You say, well, yeah, yeah, we get that. And it's like, no, when you've got a BLM district office that is not processing a permit for a cell site, or they're playing around with a mine thing or something like that, no disrespect to anybody, but quite frankly, a letter's a good thing, but a like, hey, um, tell your district director in Ely, Nevada that I'm coming out to see him. Um, and by the way, Mr. State Director, Madam State Director, if you want to come, that's fine too. Um, and if COVID doesn't work, then we can do it even quicker. How about day after tomorrow or something like that? That's not the be all and end all, but I think it's an, an often overlooked part of how do you get somebody's attention in EPA, whether it's, whether it's mine permitting, whether it's at the Department of Interior about um, DOI publication or any of those sorts of things that we're all painfully aware of get used to try to basically do things by de facto to say no. And by the way, speaking of NEPA, isn't it interesting that the people who complain the most about not complying with NEPA are the ones that now that they're in the majority are like, we don't want to go through any due process transparency type of process. We just want you to say no. Skip the stakeholders, skip whatever, skip that, all of that stuff, and we just want you to say no and abandon NEPA. So it's been kind of fun, not that there's been a lot of fun to be had these days, to be telling folks when you talk to them in the, in the media or wherever else, it's like, what, what's wrong with NEPA? Why is it that we ignore stakeholders? Why is it that we ignore responsible folks? And so I'll end with this. Whether it's water rights, whether it's waters of the U.S., whether it's grazing, whether it's uh, uh, mine permitting, whether it's whatever, the interesting thing about the time we're going through right now is the most common sense thing that everybody starts with. And that is, nobody makes money destroying the feed for their cows. Nobody makes money in the minerals industry by ruining the land and letting a bunch of stuff happen that's awful and makes for great pictures or whatever. Nobody makes money in the, industry, in the energy industry by basically destroying the resource. Nobody makes money in the forest lands by basically letting the fuel pile up so that they burn until they get tired of burning. And so, with those practical, commonsensical starting things, it's interesting to watch people squirm and go, so tell me about how mining company XYZ basically skipped all of their reclamation and made a ton of money and got away with it. It doesn't work that way. So, 
bringing this back to a reality basis is something I think that, that I'm proud to have the folks around here and Dan's leadership and Elisa's leadership in terms of going, now let's talk about the facts and the solutions instead of the agendas and the bullshit. Thank you very much. I <laughs> hope that's okay on the end. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. Appreciate those comments. Um, coming from one of our longest serving members of the Western Caucus, so thanks for being here. Mr. Biggs, Andy Biggs from the great state of Arizona, could you come and share a few thoughts that you might have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to be here with you. You notice he asked me to share just a few thoughts. Uh, so that hurts. That hurts. I got a lot of thoughts. I appreciate the Chairman Newhouse and his work and his effort on behalf of uh, of our co our common cause. And and uh, Chair Chairman Stefan, good to see you here. And uh, it's good to be in the Senate House, where I feel like I don't have to get fined for not wearing a mask, and it's really good. Uh, yeah, I don't know how it happens. The Senate side, I don't know, it's better air over here or something. Daryl, thanks for all the work that you do, too. Appreciate it so much. Let me, uh, let me just say, my, my opening premise is this, that Congress is going to have to evaluate all executive branch agencies. I mean, Mark talked about um, oversight. That is a good thing. I want to investigate all, all executive branch agencies and remove every one of them that's not authorized by con uh, under the Constitution. That's just my goal. And for decades, Congress has allowed the executive branch to usurp power that belongs to Congress or the states. And it's long past time for Congress to rebalance that power, push back on unelected bureaucrats, and limit the unfettered control the executive branch thinks it has over Americans. So mismanagement of federal lands is just one example of why the Western Caucus exists and one example of why the federal government should reduce its footprint and control. Now this is, this is important for those who don't live uh, west of the Mississippi. You've got to understand how this works. In many western states, the federal government owns more than half of the land in that state. Places like Idaho, Nevada, and Utah, over 60%. And I know Vince is going to tell you what it is in New Mexico, but I can tell you that in Arizona, only 18% of the land is owned privately. Only 18%, that's one-eight, is owned privately. That is astounding. Imagine trying to live in a rural community where you can't even get a tax base going mm -hmm. because you have no private ownership. That's, how do you fund your schools? How do you fund everything? It's incredibly difficult. And the federal government has done such a poor job of managing the land that in fiscal year 2020, Four federal agencies, BLM, Fish and Wildlife, National Park Service, and the Forest Service had a maintenance backlog, a maintenance backlog of over $25 billion. So in Arizona, national parks alone um, suffer from over $530 million, $530 million in maintenance backlogs. That's incredible. That's incredible. We have one of the busiest national parks. What is it? The Grand Canyon. It's, it's incredible. And we don't know the impact from the loss in revenue from park closures during the COVID-19 outbreak yet. It's time for Congress to review the lands under federal control and determine whether they should be returned to the state and local communities. And it's not just land management issues, but also the Biden administration's policies that are harming our communities. Last, as you know, and, and Steve talked about this a bit, Biden's America last energy policies have led to skyrocketing heating and transportation costs. His refusal to grant new drilling leases on federal land has made America less energy independent. And Steve talked about um, the local do dollars that are, are being foregone because of the loss of Keystone. But one thing it has also done is enabled Russia to capture more of the energy market and it's impeded our national security. These are a few reasons why Congress <coughs> must reassert itself over the policy of making progress. I'm, I'm excited to work with my uh, wonderful colleagues in the, in the Western uh, caucus. Uh, I'm a, very appreciative that uh, we're going to have the spring member roundtable and field tour on March 3rd th through the 5th. Now the reason that that's so critical is because the temperatures will only about, be about 85 degrees in March. And uh, we want you to... Bring your coat. Yeah, yeah, I'll be a little chilly. You guys might want to wear shorts, but I'll have my sweater on. Um, Arizona is a great state. We need your attention. We need your help. And uh, this caucus is the caucus that can really help us uh, preserve our western uh, lands 
and I'm, I'm excited to, to be working with you for the next year as well. So thanks, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'll yield back to you, sir. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. It never ceases to amaze me when I hear those statistics. 18% of Arizona is privately owned. Only, and that's not even the highest proportion of federal ownership in the country. I think that's Nevada right. owned, has yeah. that. Uh, We'd love to have 18%. <laughs> So as I, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've been able to, to develop some really strong partnerships to engage on these issues. Why reinvent the wheel? Why not work with other people that have similar interests and concerns? So, and one of those has been the Natural Resources Committee. The, the, the Republicans on that committee have been awesome. They really have. We even had some engagement by some of the Democrats on the committee, and that's been great too. Uh, with us this, this afternoon is the ranking member, soon to be chair of that committee, uh, one of the bit, best partners a, a chairman of the Western Caucus could have, Bruce Westerman. Bruce, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for the tremendous work that you do leading the Western Caucus. Um, you know, the best trips I think to go on are the Western Caucus trips. I'll put a plug in. We're going to do one in Arkansas in, in April. And I don't think it'll be quite 85 yet, but it could be. It could be snowing, it could be tornadoes. Uh, just come for it with a, uh, ready for a surprise on the weather. It could be beautiful spring weather, uh, too. And it's an honor for me not only to uh, lead the Natural Resources Committee, but also to hold an office in the Western Caucus as a, a vice chairman in the caucus to work with uh, my friend. Dan, uh, we've done several forums together where we've talked about uh, issues that are critical and important, and uh, you know we're ready to continue doing that while we're in the minority and when we get in the majority as well. And I've always said that the Western Caucus, at its core, is a rural caucus. You know, in my state, I thought we had a lot of federal land, but it's about 10% of the state's federal land, for service. Uh, we've got a lot of private land, but we also face a lot of the, the same issues uh, with our federal lands that folks further west face. I tell people that at one time Arkansas was the west. If you've seen True Grit and you know about Fort Smith, you know that it was the, it was the western extent of the country at one time. Um, and in 2022, we're going to ensure that uh, western and rural communities continue to have a seat at the table and that the voices are heard. Um, whether it's issues on private land or public land, these issues affect all of America. And I think a lot of people in the cities and the east don't realize just how much the issues that we deal with impact uh, progress in, um, in states in the east, in private, on private land. You know, I've told folks in West Texas uh, that um, you know, they, it was easy for the Biden administration to go in and kill the leases in New Mexico on the public land. But don't think they're going to stop there. They'll use the Endangered Species Act or NEPA or something on their war against energy. Uh, and that affects all of us. When we talk about infrastructure and building, uh, you can use, and I guess it happens all the time, using NEPA and using uh, laws that were put in place with a good purpose uh, to stop things from happening. We see it all the time with forestry. Uh, I just read an article where this administration is talking about um, treating 50 million acres of land over the next 10 years. They're going to treat 5 million acres a year. I just want to pull up a lawn chair and watch that. Uh, there's no way they're going to make that happen. You can't put enough money out there to overcome the obstacles that they've created uh, by kowtowing to these environmental groups that claim to be conservationists, claim to be um, environmentalists, but they're doing things that actually hurt uh, the real work on the ground that's real conservation. Uh, we're going to push back against that. We're going to keep talking about the science. We're going to keep talking about the truth. And we're going to team up with the Western Caucus, with the Resources Committee, uh, with everybody else that wants to do what's right. And we're going to push the right policies. And I look forward to working with all my colleagues in the Western Caucus. Glad to have our conference chair here today who's doing a phenomenal job. and we'll. Uh, help us with getting the word out on these issues, and I think that speaks volumes that uh, Elise is here 
um, that she cares about this, that it's important to our whole conference. And Dan, I look forward to another great year of traveling and seeing firsthand what's going on and working together to get in the country. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. And you're right, we do take some of the best trips because we go to the West, see a lot of great things in this country. Uh, I think it, that royalty for mentioning True Grit, True Grit must be really paying off. <laughs> well, I've got to take a trip back to the house full, so we'll see you later. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, go to the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Pete Stauber, who you all have gotten to know as a true champion of some of the mineral, mineral extraction industry. The, the mining and uh, mineral needs of our country are, are great. And Mr. Stauber, would you like to share a few words? Uh, Chairman Newhouse, uh, Conference Chair Stefanik, Mark, Daryl, and my colleagues, Matt Warren and others over here. It is great to be here uh, and be a member of this caucus. I have some prepared uh, statements. Um, when you talk about mining, my blood pressure goes up. When we talk about critical minerals, my blood pressure goes up. When we talk about jobs, that's what we need in this country. And this administration is doing everything possible not to allow that to happen here in America. I want you all to know that I represent the Iron Range in northeastern Minnesota. The iron ore mine there makes 80 plus percent of the steel in this country, which is a strategic national security issue for us. And on the Iron Range, we have the cleanest water in Minnesota. It's not down in the metro, it's in our rural community. With that being said, we also have the opportunity to look at what we found is called the Duluth Complex, the biggest copper nickel find in North America, in northeastern Minnesota. We have the labor force, ready, able, and willing to do that. We've been mining for close to 140 years in northeastern Minnesota. We are blessed with these minerals. And at one of the hearings, Chairman Newhouse, you were there, I asked, why won't you let, the, let us mine these minerals? Where would you like, to, like us to mine these minerals? There was no answer. The keep it in the ground mentality, we have such an awesome opportunity. If we have learned nothing from COVID, we have to hold the dependency of this nation in the palm of our own hands. And I'm here to share with you in the conference that Northeastern Minnesota stands ready to help strategically with the supply chain, reference critical minerals, copper, nickel. We have, that complex alone has 95% of the nickel reserves for the United States, 88% of the cobalt reserves, over a third of the copper and other platinum metals that we are blessed to have. And it was just less than two weeks ago that this administration put politics over science and the truth. They stripped the leases from a company called Twin Metals that were have employed 21st century technology, zero emissions, electric vehicles, this administration pulled that away from us to continuously allow us to unfortunately rely on other adversarial na uh, nations for these minerals that we use every single day in our manufacturing, in our medical instrument manufacturing, in our defense uh, department, in our iPhones. We can do better. 30 to 40,000 child miners that China employs within the Congo to mine critical minerals. This country should not purchase one ounce of critical minerals using child slave labor. Not one ounce. This administration is allowing it to happen. We can do better. In the Western Caucus and the Natural Resources, we are going to work together. And by the way, Mark, uh, I'm inviting you up to uh, Minnesota next Wednesday. We're going to look at some mines. We're going to look at some core samples. I will guarantee it's not going to be 85 degrees. I was going to say, can you turn the heat on? Yeah, can you turn the heat on? Speaking of turning the heat on, energy independence, right? Let's be, as a nation, let's be energy independent. Let's be mining dominant. We control our own destiny. Last week, 35 below in my hometown. We need to turn on that heat, reliable, affordable energy 
to keep our children and family safe. So with that, I, I, I'm so happy to be a, 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 not only a member of the Natural Resources, but the Western Caucus, because we're able to get out across this nation and see other areas of this country that are so beautiful. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm done. Thank you all for being here and paying attention. Appreciate it. Thank you, Pete. We appreciate you bringing your passion to the Western Caucus. And you're right. When we go out to visit places around the country, it's not just for our own benefit of seeing the beauty this country to have, to off, to has to offer, but to bring the voices of those local communities here to Washington, D.C., to raise those voices up so, so that our colleagues that aren't blessed to be able to go to places like West Texas, why, why else would you go except for Western Caucus would want to take you there? But to, to elevate those and amplify those voices that, uh, that need to be heard. And that's, that's a big part of the, what we try to do. Hey, Dan, can you get us any discounts at the Duluth Trading Company? <laughs> or, or is that just full, full retail? It's, it'll be full retail for you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Reclaiming my time here. Just, uh, <laughs> let, let's go uh, back to the heartland, though. Uh, we have the pleasure of having on, on our executive committee Ms. Lauren Bobert from the great state of Colorado. Lauren, would you like to come up and share a few thoughts that you have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it's really great to be um, accompanying today. Chairwoman, thank you so much for being here. Daryl, thank you for your leadership with the Western Caucus. And uh, to my other colleagues who are here, Pete, thanks for leaving a crumb trail for me. I was able to find my way to the Senate side. You know, despite being accused of leading a reconnaissance tour, I don't know my way around this place. So, <laughs> and um, uh, Mark, Yvette and I are now very much in border states. Um, after the two million illegal aliens that have crossed into our country, every state is now a border state. Colorado, uh, the state legislature, even uh, created a Department of New Americans and uh, you know increased benefits and all of this. So we're, we're right there with you in, in our once heartland states. <laughs> um, but I am very proud to be a vice chair of the Western Caucus which provides a strong voice for rural America, whether it's fighting Biden's regime's uh, land grabs or ensuring our natural forests are actively managed. I'm proud to join with the Western Caucus to lead on these important issues. I've been in Congress for a little over a year now, and the Biden regime has been waging an all-out war and an attack on Westerners and our way of life. One of the first things that this regime did by executive order was a moratorium on oil and gas leasing and federal lands and waters. This overreach disproportionately hurts rural Americans in my district which extracts oil and natural gas on federal lands. I introduced a bill to end this moratorium, repeal Biden's job killing executive mandates, and ensure reliable and affordable energy supplies. When Americans are paying more at the gas pump and paying higher energy bills, we should be turning to the American roughneck, not begging OPEC to produce more oil and block important projects like the Keystone Pipeline. One of the most important issues of my district is active forest management. Science has proven that when we actively manage our forests, we help prevent large catastrophic wildfires, improve forest health, and even reduce carbon emissions. In 2020, Colorado had three of the largest wildfires that we have ever experienced since we've been recording this data. Just one of those wildfires produced more carbon emissions in just a few short days than every vehicle in the state of Colorado running for 24 7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If these extremists actually were concerned about carbon emissions, we would start by managing the six billion standing dead trees in the West. They're all a giant tinderbox waiting to ignite. Instead of being reactive, we need to be proactive. 
I introduced the Active Forest Management Wildfire Prevention and Community Protection Act to combat wildfires, actively manage our forests, and remove beetle-killed trees and benefit the environment. I've spoke and heard from many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who want a hands-off approach to managing our public lands, to managing our forests, to managing just about anything. And these not-in-my-backyard extremists would rather take the approach of having our energy development take place elsewhere, have our enemies produce our energy, rather than having America be energy independent. In my district, we have shut down one coal-fired energy plant and another in Craig, Colorado may soon be next. All the while, China has promised to build some 200 coal-fired energy plants while they own mines in the Congo where we have 40,000 children mining for cobalt with their bare hands, child and slave labor taking place, and we're buying solar panels from China. This hands-off, not-in-my-backyard approach does not work, and we need to be good stewards of the lands that we are called to manage. These kinds of solutions are the, are the solutions that the American people need. And I will work closely with the members of the Western Caucus to address the unique challenges and opportunities in rural America. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for your leadership, and I look forward to another su successful year. Thank you. So we come down to a great, a great member from a great state of New Mexico, Yvette Harrell. Would you like to uh, come up as well? Thank you. To match me with heaven. <laughs> well, first off, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for the invitation and for allowing me to be a part of the caucus. Because you can tell everyone that spoke today, regardless of where they're from, we all represent rural communities. We all represent industries that are at odds with the government overreach. And before I get too far into this, and I really wish uh, Senator Danes was here. The wolf issue, don't do it. Mm -hmm. We did it in New Mexico. Now predatory animals have more rights than our ranchers. I mean, we have seen 30%, 40% of our calf crops killed by these wolves that have been reintroduced, and they have more rights than ranchers. It's a, it's a huge problem. The other thing I want to tap into, be, um, I wish Andy was here, is talking about the percentages of land in the western states that are managed by federal government. He's right. We don't have the tax base, so what we get instead is PILT, payment in lieu of taxes. It's Western welfare. So everybody on the eastern side of the country are taking your hard-earned tax dollars and sending them to Western states because federal government doesn't allow us to manage our lands, doesn't allow us to make our own decisions, and doesn't allow us to, to really get involved with the industries that are so prevalent in our states and so essential to this nation. And all the while, like Warren just said, and, and Pete said, you've got China relying on child labor. And here we are now asking OPEC for energy. And pretty soon, if we're not careful, we're going to be asking other countries for food. Right. Because we are putting such a, a detrimental hamstring, we're hamstringing our small producers, our crops our farmers, ranchers, I mean, and we are, it is not just about Mother Nature. I was taking notes here. I mean, it's NEPA, it's waters in the U.S., it's um, the cost of fuels, the cost of pesticides, it's the Endangered Species Act, it's Mother Nature, it's broadband. You know what? We're not that different from our friends that are so environmentally friendly because we need solar too. That's how we grow our crops. That's how we feed America. That's how we have 1% of this nation feeding 100% of this country. So we've got to figure out a way to stop the sue and settle. And in my district, there has been no sales, no permitting on federal lands for oil and gas. We have the top producing counties in the country. And now what we've done is we've compromised the ability for us to produce and create jobs. And, and here's the irony of it. Our oil and gas production is about 45 to 60 percent, uh, 45 to 46 percent of our budget. But this year, while we're here, 
New Mexico State Legislature is meeting. And think about this, every single House member, 70, are getting over $3 million each for capital outlay. That's slush money. They can use it in their districts. The Senate will receive over $5 million. You know where that money comes from? Oil and gas. And if we're not careful, we're cutting off, we're cutting off these resources. But we have to do a better job, and this caucus can do it. The Western Caucus, it's poised, it's ready, it gets it. And what we need is meaningful conversations with those that would rather go to courts and sue and settle and put cattle, cattle growers out of business, put our small producers out of business. I think we have our work cut out for us, and I think as long as we have the opportunity to get this message out and really talk to the American people about what's at stake. I hate to say this, just a testament to the school system in my state, ranked 50, but that's another, that's another caucus. But just the other day, somebody actually wrote a letter to the editor and said, why is Yvette Harrell so worried about our ranchers? Everybody knows food comes from Walmart. That's the mentality. <laughs> and sadly, I don't think it's just in New Mexico. And we've got to start talking truth to the people of America so that we can educate them on how we really do feed our families feed our industries, and keep our America alive. And the one thing I think we have to remember, it doesn't need to be divided, because we're still just one nation under God. So thank you. Thank you very much, Yvette. Well, thanks to all the members for offering their comments. I should, I'd like to recognize Jody Arrington, one of our great members of the Western Caucus here. Thanks, Jody, for coming, yeah. making sure we're doing a good job today. And that crack about West Texas, sorry about that. No, I, I'm grateful you mentioned uh, the biggest event of the Western Caucus, the biggest state, you know, essentially in the Union. Uh, that you'll be traveling to the food, fuel, and fiber capital of the world in West Texas. And so I'm excited and honored to host uh, our Western Caucus uh, colleagues and friends. We're, we're looking forward to it, Jody. And what? Three sentences. You only use biggest twice. <laughs> that's uh, that's too. You know that's too too few. It's an honor. Thank you for your no, leadership. We're, we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a, it's going to be a great visit. Thank you. We look forward to, to doing that. But, uh, so thank you guys. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Elise, for for being here with us. Now we have an opportunity while these folks are still here. If there's any questions, any comments from uh, some of our stakeholders in the room, our partners. Or certainly, I think there's a couple members of the of the media here that we open up to a question or two as well. So, if not, Liz, we're certainly happy to uh, say thank you very much for kick, helping us kick off 2022. We look forward to a great year, and thank you in advance for all of the great work that we know we're going to do together. So, thank you.